have two great communicators for you this morning. It's just such a privilege to be here at Bayside, to have so many people around us that are able to take God's word and make it come alive. And we have two of those this morning. Uh, um, one of them's called Dina. Uh, Dina, uh, she uh, is part of our Thrive School. She also heads up our apologetics conference. A wonderful girl with an incredible ability to make truth come alive. And our second speaker is Tyler. And Tyler works with our high school students over here, and he's just an all-star, so I would love you to put your hands together and give them a big welcome as they come on stage. Come on, guys. Hey. So good to see you. Hello, everyone. How are you? Good. Did you have a good Christmas? Yeah? I ate a lot of great food over Christmas. Yeah. It was a good Christmas. I ate a lot of good food, too. I don't think as much as you did, Dina, but... Did you just call me fat? I don't Tyler. think so. That's rude. It's like the easiest trap to fall into. And yeah, it is. Almost everything you say, I could just say, that's rude. You could just throw back in my face, I which really is probably going to happen all morning long. How are you, everyone? You guys good? This is so crazy. There's not two of us up here. There's three people on stage this weekend because Dina and her husband Shane are about to have a baby girl in April. Just so cool. I still can't get over that. It is good to see you in church here this weekend. I got to be honest, Dean and I weren't sure who was going to turn up this weekend. It's New Year's Eve. People are going to party tonight. Hopefully not party too hard, but they're going to go to parties tonight. But you're here. And we figured there'd probably be around three different groups of people that would be here this morning. There's going to be the faithful. Those of you who are here in church, no matter what, until Christ comes back for a second return, you're going to be in church. You're sitting in these seats. You're not going to miss a thing. Good for you. We're excited you're here this morning. Then there's probably the forced. Those of you who are literally forced to be here, because part of the deal of visiting family for the holidays, coming into their house, eating their food, was that you'd come to church with them. I'm glad you're here, too. Thanks for being here this morning. Doesn't matter how you got here. Then there's probably some of those of you who are just fired up. You made a recent decision for Jesus, maybe at one of our Christmas services last week. You got baptized recently. You just made it through growth track, and you're like, I'm going to everything I can. You got your outlines out right now. Raiders of the Lost book ready to take some notes. I'm glad you're here too. Who's excited to be in church this morning? This is good. This is a good start. Man, how fun. I got one question for you here today. I want you to think about the last time you found yourself in a tough situation. When's the last time you found yourself in a tough situation? For me, it was this last summer. My wife, Allie, and I were, came home after a long day's work, and everybody knows how hot the Sacramento heat is. When you come home, you just want to walk into your house and have it be a nice, cool 65, 70 degrees. That AC unit is pumping. It is good to be home after a long day's work. Well, you guys will know the story. We open up the door, and it is a stifling 91 degrees in our house. It feels hotter in the house than it does outside because there's no airflow at all. So I say, nah, this is not happening. So me, husband, man of the house, I march down the hallway, go to our thermostat, and I say, it must have turned off. Flick on the switch, nothing. No response. No, I'm like, the buttons, the, the, but this is what the buttons are here for. It should work. Turn on. Thermostat, turn on. Get this air moving. Nothing. Now, I'm no handyman at all. I can't fix a broken light bulb, so I have no idea what to do. My wife and I start talking, and we're going through a couple of different things, and what could it be? And I'm like, I don't know. So sweaty, discouraged, and defeated, selfish me marches down our hallway, gets to our living room, and collapses on the floor. I'm so defeated. And my wife had no idea where I went, so she walks down the hallway, comes to the living room, spots me on the ground. She goes, Ty, what are you going to do to fix it? And people, one of the lowest, least proud moments of my life, I lift up my arm, point down at my, myself and say, this, this is what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. And she says, I'm calling my dad. <laughs> no. Anything but that. I'm the man of this house. I'm your husband. But I'm like, your dad can fix anything. It's probably a good idea if you call him. It's one of those moments where you just had to surrender. <laughs> so we get him on the phone, and the first question he asks us is, uh, guys, have you checked your breaker? Of course, the breaker. Why haven't I thought of that? So I hang up the phone, run out into the backyard, find the breaker, open the metal lid, find the switch that says AC unit, 
flick it on, run back inside the house, go to the thermostat, click the button, people, like a cold blizzard in Minnesota, fresh air starts blowing through the house. I probably stood there for an hour just in front of the bed, vent, just let it flow on my face and all over. It felt so good. Why do I tell you this story? Why should you listen to the message today? Because church family, God's about to reset your spiritual temperature in 2018. He's about to do something marvelous. And everybody, it's a flick of the switch. It's all it's going to take. And what is it? What is that thing that's going to reset your spiritual temperature? None other than this right here, the Word of God. That's what we're talking about today. That is what we're talking about today, the Bible, the very Word of God that's massively going to impact your 2018 year more than anything else in this world will. And maybe some of you are here today and you're thinking, I don't know, 2017 wasn't even that good of a year. Maybe you're like, my AC went out too. I had some family problems. I had, I had some personal issues going on. I had some friend issues that I, I'm still trying to get over. Some of you are sitting here and you're like, man, I was so excited about 17. I can't wait for 18. But some of us are here today and we're like, nah, I'm not so sure. Who's to say that 2018 isn't going to be any different? Who's to say that this new year is going to be better than any other year before? And Dean and I aren't up here and trying to pretend like we get it. But I just want to say to you here today that there is one thing that is going to make the biggest impact in your life today. High school students, there is one thing that is going to make the biggest difference in your life this year and for the rest of your life, and it is the Word of God. It will change everything. It will change everything. But you have to be in it. The bad news is that we live in the most biblically illiterate generation this world has ever seen. Less and less people each year are reading their Bibles. The Barna Group just came out with a report that said one-third of all American, American adults are claimed to read their Bible once a week or more. That's it, once a week or more. Chris Brown, last time he was here, everybody loves Chris Brown. Last time he spoke here in the fall, holler out for Chris Brown, said this. Why would you ever expect Creator God to speak to you when you aren't reading the letter he's already written to you? Is that so good? We have a problem on our hands. That's the bad news. The good news, that can change any time. It's a flick of the switch. All you gotta do is to decide to prioritize the word of God. And people, we believe that God wants to pull some insights out of this message here this morning, that he's gonna speak. It's not about us being up here. God is gonna speak to each and every one of us here today. So pull out your notes. Everybody ready for this? You got your outline? Raiders of the Lost Book. Dina came up with that creative title. Hope you like it. We're excited for this message here today. And to pull out some of these truths of scripture, we decided to go through the story of King Josiah. This is found in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 22, if you want to follow along. But we got to give you a little bit of context of King Josiah's story. And the first point of context is this. He inherits a mess. He inherits a mess. You see, this was a generational thing in King Josiah's life. King Josiah, this guy, came from a long line, came from a family that was pretty messed up. Sure, his great-grandfather, Hezekiah, was a pretty good dude, but his grandpa, Manasseh, is regarded in Scripture, you can read it in chapter 21, as the worst king in Israel's existence, in Israel's history, the most wicked, evil king to ever live. And his father, Amon, wasn't that much better. In fact, Amon followed in all of his own father's footsteps, Manasseh's footsteps, but he didn't have enough time to prove it because his own guys ended up assassinating him two years into his kingship. And because of that, at the age of eight years old, Josiah becomes king of a wicked, defiant, rebellious nation. But the Bible says that he chose to do things right. He chose to follow God. Rather than his dad, rather than his grandpa, he chose to follow God. He walked in all the ways of the Lord. And actually, 18 years later, we're going to fast forward to when Josiah is 26 years old, he, he sends this guy, Shaphan, to the temple. And he says, Shaphan, I want you to go talk to the high priest, Hilkiah. He's hanging out at the temple right now. And I want you to tell Hilkiah to find all the money, collect all the money, the offering, the tithes that people have brought in. The temple's not doing so well. In fact, it, it needs some repairs. Go collect the money and start repairing the temple. And Shaphan says, okay, king, I got you. I got you. So he goes and he talks to Hilkiah. And Hilkiah says, okay, cool, I can do that. And it's as Hilkiah starts rummaging through the church corners and open up, opens up the closet doors, that he actually stumbles upon something marvelous. He finds a book, 
Point number two in the contest for context for King Josiah, he finds a book. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. People, you can't miss this here this morning. As Hilkiah is going through the temple, their church, as Hilkiah is going through the church grounds, he finds what had been lost for centuries. He finds something that is so valuable, so important, but it had been gone forever. People had forgotten all about it. He finds a book, but not just any book. He finds the book, the Bible. Church, this would be like us losing the Bible at Bayside today and no one knowing about it. No one even saying a word about it because they've been going through their life and getting used to things have been, how things have been running for years and years and years. You got to catch the irony here. So Hokiah goes to Shaphan and he tells him the news and Shaphan's like, oh boy, I got to go tell the king. So he walks up to King Josiah and he goes, hey king, hey, good news. Repairs on the temple are starting momentarily. Oh, you're going to love it. It's going to look so good. King, there's something else. Oh, we found something. The Bible <laughs> in church. <laughs> Go figure. Would you like to hear it? And for the first time ever in King Josiah's life, he listens to the word of God. So we pick it up in 2 Kings 22. It says, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. Your third fill in it. He responds immediately. As soon as Josiah heard this book, even though it was for the very first time, he responds wholeheartedly. He begins weeping. He calls all the people of his kingdom together and he says, hey, you have to hear this book. And so in front of all his people, he starts to read to them the words of this book. And then he goes on a rampage to implement what he read. And he institutes reform after reform after reform. He gets rid of the idols. He tears down the high places. He removes all of the idolatry from the nation. And he doesn't just stop there. He then starts to reinstitute some of the lost things, some of the things that God's people had forgotten. One of them, most importantly, Passover this crazy celebration of, of their relationship with the living God, he brings it back. He responds immediately. And ultimately that culminated in a legacy. And that is that he revolutionizes a kingdom. Go ahead and fill it in. He revolutionizes a kingdom. And this is what we read about King Josiah's legacy for his nation. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength in accordance with all the law of Moses. It's pretty incredible. You've probably heard of David. You've probably heard of Solomon. But King Josiah, no one followed God's book like this guy did. And it didn't just produce changes in his heart and his life. It literally pushed pause on the desolation that God had said, hey, if you disobey this book, this is gonna happen. It pushed pause on that des desolation and an entire kingdom, while King Josiah was alive, experienced peace. So the question for us here today is, what would happen if we found the book? What would happen if just like King Josiah, we found the book? Because honestly, the book has gone missing from our lives. It may be that you've read the Bible frequently, but you've gotten a little lax, or it could be that you've never really engaged with the word of God. Today, we wanna help you find the book. Because just like Tyler said, this book is the difference of resetting your spiritual temper, temperature for 2018. And I gotta tell you, I just, unpreacher for a second and just between you and me. I love this story because this is my story. I grew up in the church. The book was not lost because my parents never told me about it. In fact, they told me over and over again, read your Bible, 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 read your Bible. I'm like, yeah, take out the trash, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I never actually read the Bible. But then 19 years ago on New Year's Eve, on a whim, 11 years old, I made a New Year's resolution. I was like, I think this is the year I'm gonna read the Bible. And so what I did is I took my Bible, I tucked it under my bed, and I made the New Year's resolution, I'm gonna read a chapter of my Bible every single day. 
And with all the discipline that I didn't have as an 11 year old, somehow I kept that resolution. And I read a chapter and a chapter and a chapter every single day and I've been doing that since I was 11 years old. And let me tell you, it changed my life. On the way here this morning, I was just thinking about all of the times where God's word stepped in and redirected me, changed me. I do not know where I would be today without this book. And you might be thinking, that's a lovely little churchy story for you, reading your Bible since you were 11. But let me tell you what, my husband has the exact opposite story. He didn't even acknowledge God's presence until he was in a cell in juvie. And then he was like, oh, there's a God. And only then did he begin reading this book. And when I met my husband, do you think I was drawn to how different he was? His bad boy vibe? <laughs> no. Thank God for my parents' sake, no. You know what I was drawn to? I was drawn to how similar Shane was. Why? Because I was 11 years old reading my Bible every single day. Shane didn't even start reading his Bible till late, late into his teenage years. But once he began reading, he didn't read it daily. He read it hourly. He read it hourly. And my husband literally lapped me in his understanding of the word of God. And when I met him, I was drawn to him because his heart had been formed by the same values and his life had been guided by the same principles. And that can happen for you today. You can have a revolution in your life, in your family's life, in the lives of everyone in your circle if you will let this book find you. So with that in mind, Tyler and I just wanna ask this question. How does the word of God start a revolution in your life? And to that, we just have three things to offer you. That's right, yes we do. Bust out your outlines, flip it over because here we go. God's word communicates the truth. God's word communicates the truth. When you heard what I have spoken, and this is truth with a capital T, in a world that would love to replace truth for subjective opinion, and hey, whatever works for you, whatever makes you feel good, you do you, I'll do me. We stand on this stage here today and we say, no, scripture is our final authority. The word of God is absolute truth is absolute truth. We don't believe that this book is some old, outdated, archaic book that's irrelevant for our lives and our world today. No, just the opposite. We believe that it is alive, living, active, the inspired word of God. How do we know that? Because a guy in the New Testament named Paul writes that all scripture is God-breathed. Do you know that that phrase God-breathed is actually in the original Greek? It's the same word as inspired. The two are interchangeable. This book, everyone, is the very breath of God. He used humans to write it, absolutely, but they were divinely inspired to dictate and give to us today as a nicely wrapped Christmas present, God's message to us. And that's why we can claim here with full boldness that the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament, 66 books, people, are the divinely inspired word of God. That's where we can find questions. That's where we can find answers to all of our questions in life. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter the doubts that you have. If you have questions about who am I? Who are we? Who is God? Why did he create the world? What is sin? How did that interrupt God's plan for having a relationship with us and what did God decide to do about it through Jesus? You actually find that from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, God is in the business of redeeming humanity back to himself. So sin wasn't an issue for God because he had an answer for it. His name is Jesus. And Jesus came down, died on the cross, was buried in the grave for three days. That couldn't hold him back because he conquered death three days later to rise and never die again. People, that is truth with a capital T. That is our truth. The truth found in the word of God, found in the Bible, and we can go to it at all times. Josiah, great guy, his life was not complete until he found the word of God and heard its words. When's the last time you've sat in the presence of God and heard his words to you? How do you practice this? How do you get in a position where you can hear God's words? I believe God's got a message for you here this, this year in 2018, but he's also got a message for you today, here and now, 
on New Year's Eve. How do you hear that? How do you hear God's word for you? You can write this in. Read it daily. That's the how. Read it every day. Read it daily. How many of you will eat today? Come on, how many of us are going to have a meal today? Raise your hand. Everybody's going to eat today. Unless you're fasting, you're better than we are. You don't need to raise your hand. But most of us are going to eat a meal today. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you remembered what you had for lunch this past year on March 12th? Anyone? Anyone? No? No one? Why? Because it was a part of your daily routine. Because it was just, it's what we do. We wake up, have a cup of coffee, have a cup of tea, eat some breakfast, go to work, have lunch. It's a cycle. It's a part of our daily routine. You see, not every time you crack open this word, it is gonna be a, a revol- there's going to be a revolution in your life. You're going to have this divine revelation that's just going to shatter everything. Sometimes that'll happen, and those moments are fun. But you know what the great moments are? Just the daily repetition of spending moments with God and just be reminded that he is God, we are not, and that is totally okay. Listening to his truths and allowing them to sit and rest in your heart. So the first thing that God's word does to produce this revolution in our lives is that it communicates the truth. The second thing is that it convicts our hearts. And like Tyler was saying, this may not necessarily happen every time, but some of the times when we read God's word, it penetrates deeply to the deepest part of our being. King Josiah, you can read his response. Because your heart, Josiah's heart, was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken. Because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Okay, question. Who reads the Bible like that? Who reads the Bible in such a way that when you hear it or when you read it, you begin weeping and tearing your clothes? Anyone? Just any of you, you know, Christmas morning, your kids came out to find you because you're a super spiritual, awesome parent. You, you were doing your devos and there were mounds of tissues and your clothes were in pieces. They were like, Merry Christmas, mom. Anyone? No? Okay, me neither. But what can we do to read God's word in such a way that we have a Josiah response to it? Well, honestly, I think the best advice that we can give you, go ahead and fill it in, is to ask God questions. I mean, this is what Josiah did. As soon as he heard the word of God, he sent someone to inquire what it meant. Ask God questions. I think we've all been in those conversations where someone was listening, but they weren't really engaging with us. I mean, we've all been in those conversations where we're talking and they're nodding their head. There's an mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm but we can tell nothing's really getting through to them. Many of us, that's how we read God's word. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, 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 okay. But then there's listening. There's opening up God's word and saying, God, what do you want to say to me today? You see, Josiah knew that it didn't matter that the words were written a while ago, generations upon generations ago, he understood not only were they written for then, they were written for now. Not only were they written for them, they are written for me. Do you read God's word like it is written for you? What is the number one challenge you have going on in your life right now? Are you opening God's word with that challenge in mind? Are you opening it with that question? God, what do you want me to do about this kid? God, how do you want me to be patient? Who do you want me to be patient with? Read God's word with questions. And there's one question that is particularly important that we ask when we read God's word. And that is, God, will you change me? God, as I read your word, will you change the way that I think? Will you change the way that I see this world? Will you change my basic thought patterns and behavior? Because the truth is we've all grown up in a culture where we've just unreflectively swallowed cultural thoughts and opinions. And they seem like the most natural things in the world to us. But we have to realize that what we think and believe right now is very historically conditioned by our moment of time. 
Like, what did that mean, Dina? Well, basically what that means is what we believe today, based on our culture, 50 years ago, people would have thought was ridiculous. People would have really challenged the assumptions that we don't even know enough to challenge. Tim Keller says it this way. Wouldn't it be tragic if we threw the Bible away over a belief that will soon look pretty weak or wrong? To stay away from Christianity because part of the Bible's teaching is offensive to you assumes that if there is a God, he wouldn't have any views that upset you. Does that belief make any sense? Rich, strong. As you read God's word, you need to wrestle with the fact and the probability that some of his views may upset you. Some of his views may disagree with yours. And a great question that you can ask God is, is God, can you take your timeless word, your word that has stood the ages, um, stood by the ages, and will you change me according to it? Let God's word convict your heart and form your being. Moving on, go ahead and fill in the third thing that God's word can do is create godly action. If you are reading God's word correctly, it will produce some change in your life. It will create a ripple effect. Now we know Josiah for his response, but not just his emotional response. We know him for his actions. He instituted reform after reform after reform after reform. So I want you to fill this in. What is the how? We've got three hows for you under this one because God's word is gonna produce some changes in your life. The very first thing that God's word is gonna do in your life, if you are reading it correctly, is that it is going to remove some idols. It is gonna tackle some of the idols in your life. And, and you might be here today saying, um, Tina, I don't really have a statue of Moloch in my backyard, so uh, what kind of idols are you talking about? And you may not have a statue of Moloch in your backyard, but you may have an idol that looks like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, ripple of conviction. Or this. Mm. Or this. Or this. Oh, that one hurts. Painful. Or this. Idols are not necessarily bad things. They're just good things that become ultimate things. And when they stand before our creator, before the God who created us, they become bad things. They become idols. This is what Tim Keller has to say. The human heart is an idol factory that takes good things like a successful career, love, material possessions, even family, and turns them into ultimate things. And when good things become ultimate things, they've got to go. So as you read God's word, it's going to identify some idols in your life. And what are you going to do? You're going to take the time that you used to devote to that idol, and you are going to channel it towards things that honor God and impact his kingdom. That's what you're gonna do. So the first godly action that the word of God creates in our life is that it removes idols. The second, go ahead and write it in, is that it establishes habits. You're like, where, where is this in the passage, habits? Well, this is how Josiah instituted Passover. Passover was just this great habit in the Jewish people's calendar that every single year brought them back to God, reminded him of his, their faithfulness, uh, sorry, his faithfulness to them. We need those things too. We need habits that are gonna remind us of God's faithfulness and bring us back to God. And there's a lot of great habits that you can create. You can create the habit of weekly being in a service like this. You can create the habit of weekly serving. You can go to a small group. But today, because this is what we're talking about, we're gonna talk about establishing the habit of reading your Bible every single day. So let's go ahead and put up the habit loop up on the screen. If you remember back to our habit series that we had here at Bayside, all of science, psychology, as well as scripture speak to the same habit loop. These are the three things that you need to create a habit of reading your Bible daily. Very simple. First, you need a cue. You need to actually put in your calendar when you're gonna read the Bible. Or maybe you're gonna take your Bible and you're gonna put it on your nightstand. So it's the first thing that you see when you wake up, the first thing that you see before you go to sleep. 
Next, you're gonna create a routine. You're gonna actually figure out what works for you to help you read the Bible. And Tyler and I have made this so simple for you. Go ahead and go to the bottom of your notes and you'll see our top picks. First, download the Bible app on your iPhone or Android. It is so super easy, simple. You can download this Bible app and browse through thousands of plans that will help you get into God's word every single day. Plans that speak to the whole Bible, plans that speak to just parts of the Bible if you wanna dive in, there's something for everyone on the Bible app. Or maybe you're a little bit more visual and you're gonna wanna go to thebibleproject.com and if you find the Bible a little challenging to read, maybe this is the one for you because you can watch videos that help bring the Bible to life and explain the historical context so you have a little better idea of what's going on. And also, if you wanna take your Bible reading to the next level, we've included two of our favorite resources that will help you dig into the harder passages of scripture, specifically the Old Testament, that's from creation to the cross, as well as the number one favorite between us is how to read the Bible for all it's worth. And that's gonna be your routine. So your cue, your alarm goes off, okay, that's my cue, I'm getting into the Bible. Your routine, I'm opening up the Bible app, I'm turning to my plan, I'm gonna read today's reading. Then you need to come up with a reward. Okay, and some of you are very spiritual in this room and you're thinking, the Bible is my reward. (laughs) Yes, I just, I crave the word of God. And that might actually happen for you, that's great. But initially, when you're starting out reading the Bible, it's hard. Sometimes it's boring and it's complicated and we don't really love it so much. If so, I just encourage you, do what I do. I have my coffee when I read the Bible. And the first cup of coffee is the first verse I read and I say, I love you, Jesus. It just works together and kind of tricks your brain. Starting out, do something enjoyable as you read scripture. Habit. Cue, routine, reward. This is how you get God's word into your life. Establish this habit. Don't wait until next year. Start today. But there's one more way in which the Bible creates godly action in our lives. That's right. The last way is the word of God ignites others. You can write this in. It ignites others. Think about King Josiah. I mean, before he finds the word of God, again, he was a good guy. He was trying to love God with all his heart, but no one's life was really impacted until the Bible became a part of his life. Think about it. Thousands and millions of people, an entire nation experienced a revival because one leader of Israel and Judah found the word of God, and his life was forever changed. That's probably one of the coolest, most powerful parts of all of scripture, is that when you're diving into it, when you read it, it doesn't just affect your life. It benefits everyone else around you. And by the way, just so we're clear, Dean and I standing up here on stage talking about reading your Bible, you got to read your Bible. It's not so that we can stand up here and say, yeah, do it so you feel good about yourself so that you can mark done off your spiritual checklist, give yourself a nice pat on the back. That's religion, people. That's the opposite of what we're talking about. We're talking about a relationship, a relationship with the living creator God who wants to spend time with you who's written you 66 books and he's saying, crack them open. I got some things to say, but how will you ever know if you don't spend time with it? Whose life is going to miss out on what God might have for them this year because you're not prioritizing the word of God. Ooh, that one's sinking into my heart. Whose life this year is going to miss out because you're not spending time in God's word. Does your daughter's depression depend on you spending time in God's word this year? Does your neighbor's future depend on it? Does your wife or husband's happiness depend on you prioritizing the word of God this year? It just might. This is where you find truth. This is where you find Jesus. This is where you experience a living, active, transformative relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. How do I know that? Because it's right here. You can read about it. You can read all about Creator God. You can read about His plans for the world, His plans for your life, the hope that we have forever with Him. You know, I think for some of us here today, this message serves as a reminder, a reminder for us to kick it into full gear, 
a reminder for us not just to go through the Christianese motions, but to love and prioritize the word of God. And I dare you to do that and just watch what God does in your life this year. But for some others of us, I think this message serves as the conduit of your opportunity to experience a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what the whole Bible is about. Josiah's life was nothing until he found scripture. What is scripture pointing to all along? Well, from the very beginning, it's pointing to Jesus. Pointing to Jesus Christ, him going to the cross for you, taking your sin, your punishment that you deserved, putting it on the cross, dying and raising to never die again so that we can experience life with God forever. Some of you need to engage in a relationship with God today. Some of you need to receive the love of Jesus in your heart today. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So right now, we wanna give everybody in this room that opportunity on this final day of 2017. Could you bow your heads and close your eyes here? If that's you, you're sitting here today and you're saying, I need to have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've heard some things about him or you're learning some things about him or maybe your life's just been reminded right here in this moment about the priority, not only of God's word, but about Jesus. And you're saying, yes, I want a relationship with Jesus. Would you pray this prayer with me in the quietness of your heart? Nobody's looking around. We're not here to embarrass you. That's the last thing we want to do. We just want to give you an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus. Pray this prayer after me in the quietness of your soul. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for coming down so that I could have a personal relationship with you. Jesus, I believe that you rose from the dead three days later to never die again. God, I confess that I'm not a perfect person. I confess my sins before you now. I ask you to come into my life and to fill me with your presence. I ask that you would be my king and my Lord for the rest of my days. And I believe that I will live with you one day forever. If you just prayed that prayer, again, no one's looking around. We just want to pray over you and encourage you on your new journey with Jesus. If you just prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up into the air? Just go ahead and raise it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just raise your hand high in the air. No one's going to see. We just want to pray over you. That's amazing. Praise Jesus. You can put your hand down. Jesus, I ask that you'd be with these people, that you would walk with them, that you would talk with them, that you would make your plans known to them like never before in this new year. God, we love you. We thank you for this time that we've had. And everyone pray together. Amen. Amen.